me for our second part of our Competency 8 review for the Texas PPR exam. So this will be a great review for those practicing for the certification test in Texas for teachers in um, terms of pedagogy and professional responsibilities or the PPR exam, or it also could provide a review for my students in my Educational Foundations class. And so this is the second part of Competency 8. As you may have recalled from watching the first part of the video, we already discussed different types of engagement strategies, so overall strategies, and also we've talked about ways that we can encourage students' motivation, so different theories on how to motivate students. Now we're actually going to get into specific instructional activities that we could use in our classrooms to engage students. So hopefully you'll find it beneficial. So to begin, we're going to talk about reading comprehension activities. And some of you might be asking yourselves, oh, I'm going to be a science teacher, or I'm going to be an agricultural um, science teacher, or a music teacher, or a math teacher. I'm not going to be a reading teacher. Well, either way, you still need to have students develop skills in content area reading. If you think about it, if they're reading the math textbook, or they're reading a science article, or they're reading a historical book, they're going to need to be able to comprehend what they're reading. And so every academic subject has reading involved. And so we're going to talk about some ways that when you provide students with text related to the content you're teaching, how you can engage them. So one strategy is the reciprocal teaching strategy. And this is a kind of a routine that students can use when they're reading. And you would have to train students how to do this routine because it's, it has several steps. And you would probably need to post the steps in your classroom. But it's beneficial because basically students will work collaboratively in small groups. They're going to each take a turn as being the leader of the group, the facilitator. And basically the facilitator um, assign students a particular paragraph or whatever paragraph or section of the text they were currently on. The facilitator um, asks students to first read the paragraph. Then the facilitator goes over some of the main topics or key points. And then the facilitator then starts to ask questions for students. So um, if needed, the facilitator clarifies any confusing issues or asks students are there any things they need to go over or review? Then the facilitator poses several different open-ended questions and then helps facilitate the discussion and, and give um, constructive feedback to students. Then afterwards, the facilitator summarizes what the group discussed. And then finally, the facilitator shares some of her or his own predictions about what they're going to read next or the importance of the text. And basically, students take turns, so not the same person as the facilitator each time. It, it varies and it shifts, and this way each student can actively participate. Another reading comprehension activity that is engaging is um, it's called DRTA. So basically, before students even read a text, they make predictions about what they're going to read. Then they write them down, their predictions. Then they actually read the text and determine to see if their predictions are correct. And then, based on what they read, they revise what they um, initially had predicted into a conclusion, what they really found out. And this is a way kind of to verify whether they were correct or not. And so since students have a vested interest in um, seeing whether they were correct or not in their prediction, they'll be more likely to be engaged in this activity. Another activity could be partner summary writing. So in this situation, um, each student would have an opportunity to look at the text and read the text. Then each student would write their own summary. Then they would share their summary with their partner. And then as a partner group, students would come up with their group's summary, a cohesive summary that combines the best elements of both summaries. Another strategy is called the SQ3Rs. And so it has an interesting name, but basically it's, um, it's an abbreviation for each of the elements of this strategy. So in this strategy, first you teach students how to 
survey the text, so to look over the text features, the title, the headings of each section, the, maybe the photos or the pictures, any captions that explain the photos or the pictures, um, any highlighted print or bold print to emphasize an important part. So students just briefly look over how the, the text is formatted. Then students start to write down some of their own questions about the text and about the topic. Then um, students read the text and then um, later they, oh and while they're reading they annotate and take notes. Later they uh, recite or answer their questions basically. So some of the questions could be um, what was the main idea or um, how did, how could the student connect their own experiences to what they read in the text? Or what evidence did the author provide to support their argument or to develop the characters? And then so after students answer their own questions, then students go back, back and review to see if they um, provided enough evidence for their answers. And they review to see if their notes were enough and if they understand the text in general. And then they write a summary of what they read. So this could be a great activity for students to do on their own. But they could also do this in groups as well. Another strategy is called the questioning the author strategy. And this would be beneficial for both nonfiction or fiction texts. And so this could be used in all different content areas. But basically students do their own research about the author or in about the topic the author is writing about. Then they start to um, ask their, write down their own questions about what they would ask the author or what they, um, what they would suggest to the author or what they could determine was the author's intent. And then students share their questions with each other and then they discuss it. So, um, some questions, so the different types of questions could be questions that initiate discussions. So, for example, what was the author's message in this section? Another type of question could be questions that examine specific characters or elements of the text. So why, why was this specific character or this specific piece of information important in the story? Next are called uh, read-alouds, and these are beneficial at all ages. You see this a lot in the younger grades, but it's actually beneficial. Even older students really appreciate it. And basically um, what it involves is the teacher providing reading of the topic before they actually get into the specific uh, elements or specific facts or information the teacher is going to teach. So for example, if the teacher is going to explain things about fractions, she might read a book about that introduces the topic of fractions. Or um, maybe if um, a high school teacher is reading about uh, the American Revolution, she, she or he might read uh, a first a primary source document from that time period, maybe a journal entry or even an autobiography written during that time period in which um, the, the student, the, the, excuse me, the teacher will read to the students and while they're reading, they're making sure that they're pausing regularly and asking some um, questions to really check to see if students are understanding and also to kind of elicit more elaborate thinking. So some of those critical thinking skills we've talked about already. Um, also, the teacher can provide uh, student-friendly definitions for words they might not have known. And so based on this, uh, with these read-alouds, they're very beneficial because if students struggle with their reading fluency, then it's nice to have a model from a capable learn, uh, reader from the teacher who's a more probably mo most likely a more uh, skilled reader than students at that point because they've had more education and so students benefit from hearing from a skilled reader who enunciates and pauses correctly and has good reading fluency uh, and uh, prosody but also uh, students also get a general background information about what they're about to learn. Another idea that could really engage students before a lesson is to provide a digital jump start. So this would be if you show like a brief video clip or movie or um, maybe even a, a brief visual or even a real object or a demonstration to really get students thinking about the topic before you actually go into it. That can really catch their interest. 
Another way, and this is for um, reading primarily, is called the insert method. So um, while students are glancing over and surveying the text, they can um, annotate certain things. So they might note down a check if they've already seen that before. Or they might have a question mark if they're still confused and they want to ask the teacher something or they, they need further clarification. Or you could put a, a minus sign to show that, hey, this is something I knew that I didn't think was true. It's, it's changed my point of view. And then um, a plus sign would be something totally new they never even thought about. And so this is a nice way for students to actively be reading and um, annotating while they read to maintain their engagement in what they're reading. Because sometimes what will happen is students will be reading a text, and if it's academic and maybe complex and difficult for them, then they might lose engagement, they might end up having to reread it over and over. And so if students are actively having something to do, like a process to annotate the text, this is really beneficial in maintaining their um, their enthusiasm and also their engagement. A plot chart would be something that you could use in fiction text for younger grades, but also maybe for older grades. It would look different um, than this picture, of course. For example, the older grades use um, kind of like a, a plot line that goes up, um, kind of like a mountain almost, where it goes up and there's a climax and then there's the resolution and everything. So having a kind of graphic organizer to illustrate the plot is very beneficial for students to keep them. Um, it can also help them with their annotation of the text. Word clouds are beneficial if students have the opportunity to use technology. They can copy and paste a section of the text and then put it into a word cloud generator and there's different websites that have it. Um, and basically the word cloud generator will help them find out what were the most common words used in the text. And that basically tells them that since these words were so frequent and used so often, they're probably very important. And so students can then write down their own student-friendly definitions and then share them with their partners. Or you could even, um, after they've written down their definitions, you could have a class discussion and make sure you're clarifying that they understand these key essential vocabulary to understand that that text. Another thing that you could encourage students to do with their reading is to practice uh, understanding signal words. So um, you might have to explicitly teach this first, but basically, for example, transition words really help you understand the order and um, the sequence of the author's points. Um, so first, second, third, after, in conclusion. Other types of signal words help and help us understand, once again, the order and the sequence, but they're, they're a little bit more complex by nature, like before or after or in the past, finally. And then the most advanced signal words would be words that are used primarily in upper level academic texts that students would really need to know, like um, cause and effect, since, or for this reason, or in conclusion. Um, or eventually, or moreover. So these are words that are academic words that students might not have seen, but being able to recognize them in nonfiction text can help students keep up with the author's arguments and also helps them to better comprehend the text. So you could even have students highlight the signal words. Graphic organizers are a wonderful tool for students. They help illustrate thinking visually and it helps students also organize their thoughts. And it uses a, less words than, let's say, having to write an essay or having to read the entire text again. Um, it's a great way for students, for example, that do struggle with their reading fluency and, or maybe they're reading below grade level. Because you're using fewer words and you're using those visual scaffolds, students have a more likelihood of staying um, not only engaged in the lesson because they have something to do, but also they have a visual representation and something that's more manageable with fewer words that, can, that is easier for them to understand. It also supports note taking. So like here's an example of a circle map where people, um, where the inside is the, the subject and then the outside are like the descriptors. And there's different ones that you can see. Here's Venn diagrams that you probably use for compare and contrast. 
Um, there's cause and effect ones, main idea, sequence of events, and so it's a great way to structure their thinking and to remind students to be active readers. So another section, we're going to move on from reading strategies in particular, but now we're going to move toward collaborative, cooperative learning activities. So one collaborative, collaborative and cooperative activity could be pre-test with a partner. So in this situation, basically you could um, provide a pretest for students on a topic and then give them a text or give them resources to find the answer and then they would work together with a partner to find their answers and then you could go over the pretest with students before you actually give them your real diagnostic to see what they remember from the year before. Um, and it's a great way to also relieve anxiety. So if students get a pretest and they get to do it with a partner, they're less likely to be intimidated and um, stressed out when they're taking the real assessment. There's some great videos on YouTube on this, and um, unfortunately I haven't learned how to provide links within my videos to those, but uh, I would suggest just putting in some of these strategies in YouTube and you can find some wonderful videos on it where teachers are using them in the classroom. Another way to engage students for collaboration and cooperation are response cards. So students can work together as partners or they could even work individually. And basically a response card is having these opportunities for students to immediately respond to a question and have every student participate and not have to only choose a few students to call on. In this situation, if you pose a question, then you provide wait time and then you offer these response cards, students could answer their point of view or their thought or their, their answer, and all students get to participate. Another thing is, that's really beneficial is what you could do with these response cards is that you could have students, once again, first share with their partner and then decide on an answer, and then the partner teams share out their answer and discuss it. You could have uh, reflection opportunities where students write, work with a partner and do quick writes or summary about what they've learned. Uh, quick draws where they, if for the younger students or students who are struggling maybe with their academic language, they could also do a quick drawing instead of writing to help um, explain what they learned. You could do a word splash where students and with their partners think of the key words and then they kind of either make a visual or they make a rap or a song or something with those key words to kind of help students remember. Uh, an A to Z topic summary where students have to think of a fact about the topic for every letter of the alphabet. So it's kind of a fun way to summarize the topic. Um, and students have to be creative because they have to think of something that starts with the, each letter to explain the topic. You could provide a gallery walk. And a gallery walk is basically where students would work together first as teams. They would write down their information on a poster, and then they would post their uh, poster throughout the classroom. And you would give each group um, time to look at other students' work. And so you would maybe put a timer, maybe two to three minutes, and students would rotate. And each student could look at each other's work, and you could have a, a next Next to the poster, you could have post-it notes or a blank poster where students could either write their feedback or put a check mark if they agree or a smiley face or maybe a question mark if they're still unsure. And then later at the end, you could follow up as a whole group with a class discussion. Inside outside circle is uh, also a nice interesting strategy. Basically, you, um, you have students make two circles, a smaller inside circle and a larger outside circle. The students turn to each other, and so the inside circle turns around while the outside circle just stays where they are. And so what happens is students take turns asking questions to their partner or having a discussion with their partner. And so this is a nice way to vary the types of people students are talking with. They're not just only talking with their elbow partner that's sitting next to them, but they're also getting an opportunity to talk with various students in the class. So they turn and talk to them, and then later after they, they share their answer um, and they have the discussion out loud in class, then the students rotate. So let's say the outside circle rotates right, 
And that way, each student gets to work with a new person each time. It's kind of like musical chairs or if you ever were in dance lessons where you had to rotate and dance with different groups of people. Well, this is a way to have opportunities for students to collaborate and to give feedback and their points of view to different students in the class. Another way to provide collaboration could be having students um, have formal reflection opportunities. And one way is a 3-2-1 exit ticket. So first could be where students think about what they still have a question about the topic, two things they learned, and three things they, they know that they would like to learn more about, that they still need to develop. And so um, this they could share with their partner, they could even do it with partners and then turn it in as a group or they could even give each other feedback on trying to help each other find out, for example, um, for part one and part three, things they're still not totally sure about, maybe their partner can help them out. Another opportunity is find your match. That's where you give each student a card and then they have to find the corresponding match. Uh, dictation could be another activity where students work as a partner team to listen to um, what the teacher says and then write down the word. Then they repeat the word, then they think of their own student-friendly definition for the word and they share it with each other. Or um, to practice spelling words or vocabulary words, what could happen is one partner could have a spelling list or the vocabulary word list and then they could say the word to the student and then the student would have to write down the word then um, maybe uh, think of their own definition and their own words and then maybe use the word in a sentence, maybe even draw a picture, and then the roles would reverse and the other student would ask the first student another vocabulary word. So students would take turns reviewing. Overhead quotes is an interesting activity. Basically, it'd be where um, the teacher ahead of time posts quotes about the book or about the topic or about um, the concept, and then students have to move around the classroom and go under the quotes that they agree with. Then they turn and talk to a partner about why they agree with these quotes the most, and then they share out. Uh, True-false sorts are interesting and beneficial because basically what you could do is you could give um, a, a list of facts and also a list of incorrect information, and then students would have to sort it. And so it's a lot of it's a nice hands-on learning op opportunity for students. Uh, you could have object-based inquiry or photo analysis where you would post a particular object or piece of artwork or maybe an audio clip around the room, and students would have to either look at that piece of artwork, that photo, or listen to that audio clip, and then they would have to respond to it. They would have to form a conclusion or talk about their perception in groups, and then once again later you would come back as a whole group and share your points of view. And of course you would want students to rotate so they'd have opportunities to see and reflect on all different pieces of art or different photos or all different um, music pieces throughout the room. We kind of already talked about magnetic quotes. Sorry, I have a lot of allergies. Um, and so now we're going to talk about peer teaching opportunities. So one way is A, B, partner teach, where each student takes turns. So maybe partner A teaches one part of the lesson to partner B, and then partner B switches and now is the teacher and teaches an, a second part of the lesson to partner A. Another uh, way that involves collaboration and peer support is jigsaw reading. And so in jigsaw reading, basically the teacher breaks students into groups and assigns each group a specific part of the text or a specific story or book or article. And then um, the students come back and the students have to teach the class what they read. Another way to implement jigsaw reading would be this form called um, ambassadors, where students would break up into groups read their particular story or text, and then they would share with their group kind of a summary or what their main takeaways are from the text. And then students would now find new groups that the teacher would assign. And in that new group, there would be a person from each of those original groups to share and discuss what they learned with their first group to their new second group. So they're basically an ambassador to their second group explaining what they learned from their first learning experience with their original group. 
You could have find my rule activities where students, it's kind of like an inductive learning opportunity where students get um, specific facts or specific um, information and then they have to come to a conclusion. So they get a bunch of clues and then they become, they form a rule or a law. And then later the students share what they learn and then the teacher provides students feedback whether they were correct or not. Students could write content blogs online where they create their own websites or um, they create maybe a classroom blog where students write their thoughts on what they've read. You probably have seen this in um, maybe your college experience with your online learning, like your discussion boards where students write their point of view and they share and they can comment on each other's points. You could have students make Google Slides presentations, which is basically a PowerPoint. It's a free PowerPoint system. And students really enjoy that. They like the ability to find their own piece of art, their own videos to explain their topic of their choice. They enjoy having the freedom to pursue and research something that they're interested in, having more choice. And also they like the fact that they can implement uh, multi-sensory elements with video, audio, and visuals. Showdown is a great activity as well. That would be where students, each student has a whiteboard, the teacher poses a question, um, students either work together first with a partner or they work independently. Then they get an answer that they share with their partner uh, and they change their answer if necessary and then they share it to the teacher. I have who has is also an interesting engaging activity. This would be where each student would have a card and they would relate to each other. And students would, um, eat, the card ha would have two elements. The first part would be the student saying, I have this, who has blank? And so um, each student would have a card that relates to the other. And so it would require that every single student is paying attention and every single student is actively involved. And so students would be um, motivated because they feel peer, um, peer motivation to want to please their peers and be successful in this activity. So an example might be um, maybe one student has a card that says, I have a, I have a square who has a three-sided shape. And then another student would say, I have a triangle who has a five-sided shape. And then a third student would say, I have a hexagon, uh, sorry, a pentagon. I have a pentagon who has a shape with no sides. And then someone would, the fourth person would say, I have a circle, who has blank? So it keeps on going in order and each student has an opportunity to participate. Uh, four corners is a similar to magnetic quotes and that basically you, in four corners of the classroom, you would post um, a answer or a conclusion and then students would, um, after you pose a question, students would go to whatever answer or conclusion or point of view they hold, and then they would discuss with their, with their classmates why they hold that point of view. Then, that people who are similar, that joined, that held, held similar viewpoints, um, they would share with each other, then they would share out to the class, and then after they've shared their point of view, students have an opportunity to vote again, to move. If, let's say, um, most students chose the wrong answers, but there was one group of students that chose the right answer and they explained it very effectively and, and showed clearly why this was the right answer. Then you can give the students the opportunity to go all together to the correct answer and so they can change their point of view and, and, and learn from their peers. Think pair share chart. So this is just a formal way to keep students accountable. So you can always have think pair share. You can pose a question and students turn and talk to a partner. Uh, and then so and then they share out to the class. Well, you can have this graphic organizer just to make sure that students know that they have to produce something. They can't just say, oh, I talked to my partner. They actually have to um, write down what exactly they were thinking on their own. What did they what did their partner think? And then what did uh, what will you share together? So it also kind of helps facilitate discussion as well. You could have uh, role play opportunities. We talked about this in the first section of competency eight, but you might have students act out a certain part of the story. You might have students create their own skit or play to explain the story or the element 
or the topic. Students might have to um, pretend like they're a famous character or they might have to act like um, a certain scientist or some, some part of the informational lesson that you've discussed, they have to act it out. Uh, maybe acting out the vocabulary word. And then um, this could also be incorporated with reader's theater where you give each student a part and you give them a script that's academic in nature and teaches a concept. So not only are students practicing their reading fluency and practicing their part with reading with their groups and then sharing out as like a play in front of the class, but also students, if you make the reader's theater based on the information of the content, then students are getting more exposure and more reinforcement with what they learn on the topic. So you could have a reader's theater on multiplication, for example, or the water cycle. Interactive quiz games are wonderful. Um, as much as possible, try to make them collaborative by placing students with partners so they're not just working only on their own. Um, ideally, you want to have heterogeneous grouping where you have some advanced students, some on-level students, and maybe some students that need additional support, and students of all different language levels, beginner, and intermediate, advanced, and advanced high. That way, um, students can support each other and students can see the modeling of correct language patterns. And um, some great uh, tools like our Kahoots, quizzes, online Jeopardy, and a lot of them already been, have been created by teachers. And so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can just search on the topic you're teaching and many times you can find some that are already created. So then we want to talk about vocabulary activities. So there's some very beneficial vocabulary activities and you need to explicitly instruct students with on vocabulary. That's really important. That's not only beneficial for your English language learners, but it's also very beneficial for all students because most students are unfamiliar with academic vocabulary. They might know the informal vocabulary, the everyday playground talk or home talk that they have with their friends and their brothers and sisters and maybe even their parents, but many of them are not exposed to the academic language we use in the classroom, on standardized tests, and in the textbooks. So you need to explicitly teach vocabulary. There's different ways to do that while maintaining students' engagement. One way is word sorts. So you could have students sort words based on spelling patterns, based on similarities, um, based on certain characteristics, and so that's a nice hands-on way to help them understand words um, and to classify words. You could have a vocabulary self-collection strategy. So in this situation, students would read a text. They would think of the words that they found were the most important to understanding that text. They would discuss those words with a partner. They would write down, they would decide upon with their partner what were the most important words. They would write in, the, in a journal or someplace those words, then they would research on their own what were the meaning of those words, then they would go back and then share what they learned with the class. Uh, word walls are a great way. You could have interactive word walls where when students think of a new word they've learned or they've seen in the text, they could create their own spot and place a the word under the given letter of the alphabet. And so it also helps students with spelling as well. And if you can provide visuals, that's great, like in this example. Personal dictionaries are a wonderful way for teach students vocabulary in a hands-on, engaging way that's also personalized and individualized. Basically, students have um, opportunities to write down new words that they haven't seen before um, based on each letter of the alphabet. And the teacher can guide students based on their age level for the younger students, you might have to already include some words that they that are important, like high frequency words for that grade level that they would see over and over in their text. And then students would have, over time, throughout the year, fill in their own definitions or write down their own um, spelling, their ways to spell each um, word. This way, it helps them uh, not only practice spelling and have those words written out for reference, but ideally, if you include the student-friendly definition as well, students have something they can refer back to if they ever forget a certain term uh, on the topic. Four Corners vocabulary charts um, 
or the Friar model, they're kind of interrelated. But um, I really like the Four Corners vocabulary chart in the sense that um, basically you have the word you're defining, then there's um, four different boxes, uh, four different sections. And normally what I did when I was a, a teacher, when I was teaching vocabulary, was that I would have students write a student-friendly definition. They would um, give some synonyms or antonyms or some examples or non-examples. Then they would draw a picture of the word, and then I would have uh, them write three sentences using the word, and I would give them feedback. And that way students get various exposures to the word and in different contexts. And then you could make this collaborative by having students work with a partner or sharing what they did with a partner after they're done. A concept definition map is similar to kind of like the Frere model or the Four Corners model. It's just a little different. As you can see, um, basically, it's the concept, and then students have to think of, they have to explain what is it, think of some examples, they have to write it in a sentence, they have to think of um, similarities or other ways to describe it, what commonalities does it have, and then they have to provide an illustration. Closed sentences are a wonderful way to also teach vocabulary, especially if students have probably already seen the words before. A good way to practice with them is to have these closed sentences where you leave a blank within the sentence and students have to use their context clues from reading the sentence to understand what word should go there. And if it's um, new words that students maybe have not seen, uh, or maybe just to provide additional scaffolds for your English language learners or for students who, who maybe do not have the academic vocabulary yet, it would be wonderful to provide visuals like in this example here. Uh, word generation games or activities where you might put a root word on the um, board like viz, and then students have to come up with words similar to it. So visual, revise, um, visible, um, I'm trying to think of some other ones, but I'm sure that um, I'll, there's other ones. But uh, you can have students think of different words using that root word or that prefix like un or dis or that suffix like full or nis. And so word generation activities are a fun way to practice with different parts of words. The root words the prefixes that go before a word, and then the suffixes that go after the word. You could, of course, play vocabulary games. I always enjoyed doing the crossword puzzles for words I knew. Um, you could do Scrabble if you, you would have to make sure you, you teach that and you model that. You could have another fun game is Academic Taboo. And in this situation, like you could give them a card like this. Um, and you would cut the cards up and so that students would, um, and maybe you cut them up individually and put them in a hat or put them um, in a way where students can't see the cards and then they would draw a card and then they would have to s explain to their group the word um, in a, using other types of words that are not common. So basically they'd have to be creative in explaining a word. So if they wanted to explain uh, board, they couldn't say uh, white or black or right. They would have to use other words to explain what the word board means. And so um, you could take turns, students could work as a class, and then um, you could give them a time limit. So if the first group doesn't, do, doesn't guess it, then the other team could steal the point. And so you could keep points, it could be a fun, um, Fun, friendly, competitive game, but also learning um, different words. And also making sure students practice circumlocution, which is basically explaining a word in different ways, um, trying to explain what you mean using other words um, that are not the given word that you are trying to say. And circumlocution is beneficial because, for example, sometimes when you're interacting with someone, they might not understand what word you use, so you have to think of other words that they do know to explain that concept. So um, academic taboo is a great opportunity to teach students uh, how to do circumlocution and how to think on their feet, to be extemporaneous. Then we also have the word association circle. And this is a nice visual way um, to connect new vocabulary terms to students' prior knowledge. So basically you would have the word and then students would think of descriptive words, and then based off those descriptive words, they'd think of other 
words to describe those des those descriptive words. So it'd be like a whole link, and students see the whole connection of what they're discussing. So if you see magic, uh, one of the description words was magician. Well, then of that, you could think of there's sorcerers, there's fairies, there's wizards, there's witches, there's different types of magicians. So students are really expanding on their vocabulary and learning new words. And if they work with partners, they're going to definitely pick up new words or or think of things they hadn't originally thought of based on each student's own individual experiences and prior learning. And so it's a great way for students to collaborate and to build on each other's knowledge and also to teach each other new words and concepts. Uh, word lottery is a nice activity. Basically what would happen is um, students would pick out a couple words from a box and let's say you might have different boxes. You might have nouns, a noun box, you might have a verb box, and you might have an object box. And then students have to make a sentence with that. So if you picked out from the noun cat and the verb run and the object, um, or how about an adverb instead of the object, quickly, then students would have to make a sentence like the cat ran quickly to catch the mouse. So it's a nice hands-on activity and students can take turns and they like the unpredictability, um, the newness of having to, you know, the, the, the positive, not intimidating uncertainty of wondering what word they're going to pick and whether they're going to be able to think of a sentence. And you could even have students work as a team. They could each take, pick a word in the group, then they could come together as a group and decide how they could make a sentence with it. So it could be collaborative. Vocabulary bingo is a great way. You could use closed sentences where you have those fill-in-the-blank sentences. And then you could offer it. You could read out the sentence with a blank. And then students would have to um, think of the word. Having cards with visuals would be very beneficial, especially if students had just recently learned this new vocabulary. So I believe that's it. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. And... Um, Look forward to our part three of Competency 8 coming soon. Thank you.